The Basic Physics of Global Warming. This video is related to a book that I'm writing along with Philip Daprich and Alan Cottrell about planning in the time of um, climate crisis. Um, why, the question which people may ask is why am I bothering explaining the mechanism behind global warming? Surely everyone knows what it is. The problem is that there still exists substantial scepticism about uh, climate change. Although the scepticism is far more prevalent on the right than the left, there is a bit of an overlap and some people on the left think that it is a, a scam as well. But beyond that, the popular account we're given of why global warming occurs is actually too simple. And there are holes in the popular account which sceptics are able to make use of and cast doubt on the the basic mechanism. And you need to be able to understand at a slightly more sophisticated level what the basic mechanism is if you're going to be able to refute these kinds of objections. Now the possibility that humans might change climate by burning fossil fuels was recognised way back in the last decade of the 19th century by Svante Arrhenius who was a Swedish scientist. But at the time, it was anticipated this, was, this would take many centuries. And if you look at the rate at which coal was being burnt in 1900 or 1890, that might have been plausible. But as more of the world industrialised, as cars came into use, the amount of fossil fuel being burnt increased, and systematic measurements started to be undertaken during the International Geophysical Year in 1957. And from that point on, it became evident that carbon dioxide levels really were rising, rising to a measurable extent. And through the 1960s, it became a matter of increasing concern within the scientific community. If you go back even further, the fact that the atmosphere affects the surface temperature of the Earth was first understood by Fourier in 1827. He observed that the Earth's atmosphere is transparent to incoming radiation from the, the Sun, but very absorbent to thermal radiation being admitted by the Earth. So this is the basic mechanism of the greenhouse effect was understood from the 1820s. The English physicist Tyndall later discovered that this was not due to the main ingredients of the atmosphere, nitrogen and oxygen. Instead, thermal radiation was primarily being absorbed by trace gases, water vapour and carbon dioxide, which made up less than 1% of the atmosphere. I've taken this illustration from Tyndall's book on lectures on heat. And as a matter of historical interest for those of my left-wing viewers. It turns out that Karl Marx was a regular attendance at Tyndall's lectures on the theory of heat. Physics students uh, today will commonly carry out a version of Tyndall's experiment where they shine a laser through a gas cell and pick up the on a detector the signal from the laser and if you've got a tuned laser you can detect the different degrees of absorption the gas will carry out um, due to the the carbon dioxide being present there or whatever the other gas is indeed um, once semiconductor lasers became available, 
these kinds of things st started to be mass produced as carbon dioxide detectors or or carbon monoxide detectors in other cases so it's a, a well established technology now what was Arrhenius's basic theory um, the the effect of the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere is that much of the heat radiated from the surface of the Earth is blocked from escaping to the outer space by water vapour and carbon dioxide and instead heats up the atmosphere. And only infrared light which is emitted high in the atmosphere can escape into outer space because there are, there are less greenhouse gases between its point of origin of the radiation and the space which absorbs it. So let's look at this picture. Sunlight comes in, a portion of it is reflected off clouds before it even reaches the ground. Another portion is reflected off surfaces on the ground and enables us to see those surfaces. But a portion is absorbed by the, the earth, the plants, the water. These then warm up, and as they warm up, they must emit black body radiation in the infrared frequency band. This then goes up and is scattered in the atmosphere. Some is scattered back to the ground, so that in addition to the visible light hitting the ground, there is backscattered infrared radiation hitting the ground that has been scattered from the atmosphere, thus making the ground warmer. And eventually some of it gets lost to space. The basic account, popular account, of the um, greenhouse effect is that it's due to this backscattered radiation. But right at the time that Arrhenius published his theory, another Swedish scientist, Angstrom, argued that it can't be right. He said that the absorption of infrared radiation by the Earth's atmosphere has already been saturated. I see I've misspelt absorption here, but the if you start off with intensity one of light, infrared light, at ground level with the carbon dioxide content that the air currently contains, you get a rapid exponential decay in the amount of carbon of uh, infrared light that can penetrate. So that by the time you're at 40 meters, only 20% of the infrared light will get through. According to Anstrom, there's so much, um, well, this is not just carbon dioxide, it's water vapour as well. There's so much water vapour and carbon dioxide in the atmosphere that it was already effectively impermeable to um, infrared radiation. And therefore, if you put additional carbon dioxide in, Angstrom said, it would have no effect because the air is so impermeable to infrared light that any infrared radiation leaving the ground surface is absorbed within the first hundred meters or so of the air. So how could carbon dioxide alter or changes in the concentration of carbon dioxide alter the climate? He said it should have no significant effect. The point is though that there has to be an energy balance. The radiation emitted in the f form of uh, infrared radiation from the Earth after it escapes the atmosphere has to balance the solar energy coming in, at least roughly. One can allow that if the Earth is heating up, some of the solar radiation has been retained to melt ice, for example. But in the main, in equilibrium, it has to, they have to balance. And the amount of infrared radiation emitted 
will be determined by the effective temperature of the Earth as seen from space. And the emission of infrared radiation will follow what's known as the Stefan Boltzmann law, which is that the emission E is the temperature raised to the power of 4 times the Stefan Boltzmann constant, which I give down here. So the emissions are dependent on the fourth power of the temperature, which is uh, an important relationship. It's a very high power. If you feed these figures in to the Earth, um, and you take the solar constant, which is the amount of sun that sunlight that arrives every square meter above the Earth in space, and then adjust for the fact that the Earth is a sphere, and therefore the Earth's surface is considerably larger than the shadow which it casts. Um, so that the, uh, the area of the total surface of the Earth is much larger than the area of the circular shadow cast by the Earth. This takes the amount of incoming light per square meter to about 340 watts per square meter, effectively, on the Earth's surface, averaged over day and night, averaged over equatorial and polar regions. The albedo of the Earth is about 29%, which means about 29% of the visible light gets reflected straight off by clouds, etc. And that means that the absorbed energy must be about 240 watts per square meter. If you put that into the formula, you find that that means the temperature of the Earth must be around 256 degrees Kelvin. Now 256 degrees Kelvin is about minus 17 centigrade. So this doesn't seem to correspond to, to, to the facts. Uh, we know that the average temperature of the Earth is quite a lot more than that. In fact it's about 14 and a half degrees. So why is there such a big difference between the average temperature of the Earth, which we get from the Stefan Boltzmann relationship, which has to be what a, a distant astronomer would see as the temperature of the Earth, and what we actually measure on the surface. It's because the temperature of minus 17 degrees is the temperature of the atmospheric layer from which the infrared radiation eventually escapes to space. It's not the temperature of the surface of the Earth, it's the temperature of an upper layer in the atmosphere from which the infrared escapes. If you look at the, the process here, there are three types of photons you can consider. Some of them are of a wavelength which gets right through the atmosphere because none of the greenhouse gases are able to absorb it. That's type A. Some of it is strongly absorbed by water vapour and carbon dioxide. And this shoots up maybe 50 metres, is absorbed by a, a carbon dioxide molecule or a water molecule. The water molecule, after a a short period of time um, gives some of its energy up to the nitrogen and oxygen around it, but at some point it will re-emit radiation, some of which will come down, some of which will go up, and this process repeats itself many, many times, maybe 150 times, before the photon eventually escapes into space, and it escapes into space when it is released at a layer where the amount of carbon dioxide above it is too small to intercept the photon. There's another um, set of 
um, photons of a frequency with such that they'll only get absorbed maybe once by carbon dioxide. Now it's clear that if you increase the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere more of these type C photons will be absorbed but they make up a relatively small effect on the um, climate change. Similarly with type A photons, they only make a small effect on the uh, climate change. You have to concentrate on these type B photons. So if we assume that the carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere doubled, a photon that is currently able to escape from the top layer of the atmosphere would be absorbed or its chances of being absorbed would double and the effective layer at which the photons would escape would be a layer where the atmospheric pressure is half what it is now if you doubled the amount of carbon dioxide. Now there is another factor you have to take into account which is known as the adiabatic lapse rate which is the rate at which the atmosphere cools down as you go up in altitude and it cools down six and a half degrees centigrade per kilometer of height which is why mountains are often snow covered. Why does it cool down? Well if you consider a packet of hot air near the surface of the earth rising it expands and the expansion cools it down and this maintains a temperature gradient a negative temperature gradient as you go upwards it's currently minus 17 degrees at an average height of about 4.9 kilometers and this is the average infrared emission altitude at the moment. If you increase the amount of CO2 it raises the average emission altitude. If carbon dioxide was the only gas involved in infrared emission then if you increased carbon dioxide concentration from 400 parts per million to 500 parts per million it would tend to raise the emission layer at 17 degrees cent minus 17 centigrade to 6.7 kilometers. Now as only about 5% of the IR is being absorbed by carbon dioxide the effect is a lot smaller than that. I gave that as an example to, to show in principle what happens. But for each kilometer rise in the effective emission height the Earth's average surface temperature has to rise by 6.5 degrees centigrade in order to maintain this constant drop rate of 6.5 degrees per kilometer. Therefore, should the carbon dioxide concentration rise, the emission height of the infrared radiation rises and because of the adiabatic lapse rate the ground temperature has to rise in order to ensure that the minus 17 degree layer can be supported at a greater height and that is the basic mechanism behind it and that is the basic mechanism that just relies on straightforward physics it doesn't rely on any very complicated um, climate modeling.